Great. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, so um, it's really a great honor to be able to uh, to come back here again, and it's really wonderful to meet everyone else on this panel that I haven't met before. <clears throat> um, I guess you know I I wanted to try to talk a little bit about technology in the actual sense of talking about some of the technical details. So one of these uh, common points that we hear in common both from the European cyber crime people as well as the NSA is that they need to be able to watch to keep us safe. <clears throat> and in principle, I think most people agree that that to some degree is true. Um, that is, if they're going to be keeping us safe, then they have to be watching us. But I think one of the core problems is that actually we don't get safety by them watching us. Certainly not the NSA. I mean, I'm sure Belgacom does not feel particularly safe right now, and they were heavily watched. Um, so it isn't merely the case that surveillance alone will bring safety. Sometimes we make trade-offs. So for example, there is a way to configure a web service um, in what is called forward secret modes. That is, the web service or the transport layer security uh, service actually offers a cryptographic mode where you identify yourself. That is, the server says, I'm LavaBit, as an example. And then this service generates a random key, and then this key is, hopefully, if it's configured properly, it's destroyed at the end of the session. Um, this is really important because what it means is that dragnet surveillance is thwarted even if they're able to extract this identity key. It, it isn't the case that it is always configured in this way. And this is a policy thing which I think the European Union could push forward, which is making sure that the technology that is configured in this way, that's what we would call secure. We wouldn't call it secure unless it was configured in this way. And this is something which can be audited. There's a really great website um, run by, uh, I think it's Ivan Ristic, uh, SSL probe. It's the Qualys SSL probe. And you can actually run it on uh, services. You give it a URL, and it'll tell you a grade. You know, a lot of websites, they get an F, for example. Lots of services get a very poor grade. Um, this will, of course, make it very difficult to do surveillance because you can't just go to the provider and make them an agent of the state in secret anymore. Um, then I think so in this regard, this kind of technical change can actually ensure that the things that we don't want, let's say dragnet surveillance, um, that they're significantly more difficult to do. And, and I think this is important for individual particular surveillance you can still, of course, do an attack on this person. Um, you can still surveil a particular person, but it's very, very difficult to get everybody all at once retroactively. And that is to say, right now, if you get this special key, if you were to get, for example, Ladar's SSL key for LavaBit, if the FBI had been recording all the traffic going into his service and he were to be forced to give it up, he's not just forced to give up the future. He's forced to give up the past as well. And this is a new, this I think is actually a new thing, which is an egregious retroactive policing that we should be extremely skeptical of, um, especially when we consider the NSA's broad wiretapping, which is to say, if they're recording a great deal of traffic on the internet all the time, the only thing that stands between them making sense of that illegally captured data and not is this key. And therefore, it's very important that at least if they're going to, in the long run, get the key, we would like it, I would like it, such that that key is worthless, except moving forward for active, specific active targeted surveillance. And I think a really key thing is to make sure that the laws let the person under surveillance know that they're being spied on. And this is a very controversial thing, I suspect, with police who like to operate in the shadows. So there, there certainly is the case that if we have this, it will change behaviors. But so too when people were being followed, Right? I mean, when people saw a policeman sitting outside their house writing down license plate numbers of cars that park there, people knew that that was taking place. And so when we discuss this idea of consent, we need to consider that we have not arrived in a perfect surveillance state where we actually had a debate and a discussion about it. What happened is that we slowly got here, and along the way there were very reasonable discussions, and then we found out we actually were somewhere totally different. And this is not something that we consent to. I actually don't think that the police have the right to do complete dragnet surveillance. And I actually don't think they should have the right to do it in secret. Because there's almost no difference qualitatively and quantitatively between cyber criminals, so-called, and what the NSA is doing. 
And if you can't tell the difference between the methods and the tactics and the strategy of the state and criminals, you're in serious trouble with your state, especially when your state starts to target you. So, um, you know, to that end, I would, I would offer a, a very uh, simple analogy. I mean, poaching is a really big problem, for example. And um, I think we'd all agree that surveilling areas like a wildlife preserve where there are some animals that would be endangered, it's an important thing to do. But we need to be proportionate. So to get rid of the poachers, you don't want to firebomb the cheetahs, right? We need to make sure that we actually safeguard our liberty and we don't simply give it up. It's a, it's a false trade-off to do this. So we should find ways of dealing with the serious problems, let's say the poachers, without getting rid of the actual prized thing that we care about, which is liberty itself. So to that end, we should not really talk about data, uh, data protection, but people protection. Datenschutz, uh, Datenschutz is a really strange term to me because it is not data that needs protection. Data that the state has unfettered access to is not private just because we perceive it to be private. Quite the opposite. It is actually in the hands of the people who can do the most harm with it in some cases. Um, and I think it is also important to get rid of data retention, period, full stop. And the reason is because we are creating a sort of Exxon Valdez situation or a data Valdez situation where at some point someone will get access to this data and they'll dump it and they'll put it online. And even though it will be a crime to keep a copy of it, it will still be out there and you will not be able to take this back. So getting rid of data retention actually reduces really serious amounts of liability which we're taking on. So what LavaBit did is brilliant. They said, we are not required by law to keep this data and we don't want to betray our users, so we're not going to keep it. And as a result, when the FBI acted beyond their legal scope, at least what I think is, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer and I'm definitely not Ladar's lawyer, but I know Ladar's lawyer and th she's really good. Good luck on that, by the way. And, and I, I think it's, it's important to, to, to recognize that, that the FBI is going to go as far as they can. The NSA is going to go as far as they can. And because in many cases they operate in secret, having this data there at all means that it will be abused. An example of this is the NSA's love int, their so-called love intelligence, where NSA agents spied on people that they had crushes on or that they were married to or that they were divorcing from. Right? So this is an example of just one very small abuse of this data, but it can be huge. And imagine if you were one of the people targeted by that program and you tried to talk about it with someone, people would think you were crazy. Well, the thing is that the more people that have access to this data, the worse it becomes. And it also attracts the worst kind of people. So let's say only good people want to be police officers today. What happens when they have access to this data? some not so great people with some very different intentions will now have access to this. So that's a big policy change that I think is important. And we should also look at the discussion between strategic surveillance and tactical surveillance. That is to say, whole population surveillance is something which should probably not be done. This is something which we, if we can outlaw it, I think we should just completely. And tactical surveillance is a thing we cannot stop, but economics limits it. But it doesn't limit it very much from the perspective of the state. So for example, this idea of a, a bugging someone's house is absolutely an affront because it means that a person has no place in their whole life where they can lay their head down and feel free if they suspect themselves to be under these kinds of surveillance regimes. And I personally have experienced that myself. I, I cannot remember the last time that I went to bed and thought I could freely talk in that place or even think of what was in my head out loud. And that comes from the fact that the law does not limit a budget that is unbelievable uh, for these kinds of surveillance operations. It doesn't limit it. It would be possible. It would even be something they could bring in a court. So this kind of limit is something I think if we're going to have a state that does help us, one of the things it should do is to tell us that we have some liberty, not just in our homes, but actually in the activities we do. So when we call someone and they happen to be in the same house, just because we have to use a cell phone that routes outside of the house, we shouldn't lose our assumption of privacy. This uh, Smith versus Maryland was used in my legal case as well, Ladar, uh, USA v. Applebaum, which is the Twitter, uh, the Twitter case that I was a part of. Uh, and they said that if you, you know, disclose the phone number to the phone company, you have no expectation of privacy. But th this is, I think, just a completely crazy thing. Um, 
especially because the people that are impacted by these things rarely know that they're impacted by it. Um, so to that end, I, I wanted to say there's this really fantastic book, which is called The Real World of Technology. It's by Ursula M. Franklin. She's a Canadian physicist. And I wanted to recommend that everyone here reads this book. Um, I'm about halfway through it, so I can't say that it's, you know, I've read every part of the book, but every single time I read a page, I basically earmark it because it has some brilliant thing in it. Um, and I guess I'd like to close by saying that um, we sort of live in the, the, golden, the golden age of surveillance. But in, I've noticed a really interesting discussion point, which is that what people used to call liberty and freedom, we now call privacy. And we say, in the same breath, that privacy is dead. This is something that really concerns me about my generation, especially when we talk about how we're not surprised by anything. It's a generation of total cynical downers in some ways. And I think that we should consider that when we lose privacy, we lose agency, we lose liberty itself, because we no longer feel free to express what we think. And I, I was at a protest recently in Berlin, a Freiheitsstadt Angst protest, where there was a poster of a person who said out loud, yes, but in their head, in a thought bubble, it said no. And I feel like that perfectly encapsulates what's actually happening here, which is that people are even afraid to say that they're afraid because they understand the chilling effects that come from this. And just because a judge who does not understand technology signs off on it, that does not actually make me feel better. Just because, for example, in Holland, it, I think is in, it's something like 62 uh, out of every 100,000 people are wiretapped, just because a judge signed off on those things doesn't make me feel good. The FISA court also signed off, if you can call it a court, the FISA court also signed off on dragnet surveillance of the whole planet. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't bring me any peace, especially when these judges barely read their own email. They have a secretary that prints it out for them. They think the internet is something that comes on foot. Uh, this is, to me, this is not, this does not bring me any, any sort of peace. And to that end, I want to make sure that we don't, you know, and my last point here is to say, there's this myth of the passive surveillance machine. But actually, what is surveillance except control? I'm sorry to plagiarize Foucault here, but it's extremely important to understand that the NSA deployed their massive surveillance machine against Iraq before the Iraq war and during the Iraq war. They killed over 100,000 people illegally in that war. How many people have terrorists killed if you don't count the US government amongst them? I'll tell you, this is something that really bothers me, this notion that surveillance exists in a vacuum is nonsense. And that the NSA are passive, this is nonsense. What we see with Belgacom is that they actively attack European citizens, American citizens, and in fact, anyone that they can if they perceive an advantage. They leave us purposefully vulnerable, and then they exploit that vulnerability. And then they pass that information along, not just for the purposes of an illegal war, but they use it in drone strikes as well. So think about it this way. America's assassination program is directly linked with the NSA surveillance. Maybe we need to change the fundamental architecture that allows that to be possible. And we need to think surveillance is control. And one of the most extreme forms of control is outright murder. And that is what my government is engaged in right now. And this is something which Ladar is fighting, I think, quite, quite well. And I hope that he wins. But this is, this is really what we are getting at here, which is it's not an abstract thing. It's directly and concretely tied to this. And we'll see this in the future. There will be things that show this, that the NSA surveillance and drone strikes are tied together. And so that's thousands and thousands of people murdered without a trial, without a judge. And this surveillance is an so-called legal or authorized surveillance. So I think it's totally out of hand. And with some technical changes, we can really make some big differences that change the economics. And when we change the economics, we can force the policy to actually shift in line with what people in a democracy would like. So thank you.